Hello, folks, and welcome out to the Single Player Podcast. I'm your one and only host, I'm 16-Bit, and I got a good show for you this week. We're going to be talking about Sony buying Insomniac, the Sega Genesis 30th anniversary, as well as the Ion Fury controversy. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and we'll be right back after this. All right, folks, and we're back. And our first topic is actually some pretty major news as Sony has announced that they've officially acquired Insomniac Games. Of course, this comes off the heels of the success of the Spider-Man game, which came out last year, though, uh, confession, I've never actually played it. Uh, It came out the same week as Dragon Quest XI, and for me, it was either Spider-Man or the one game I've been looking forward to for years, so... It was a hard decision, but in the end, I think I chose wisely. Anyway, though, I the funny thing about this was sort of seeing the reaction to some people because for everyone, they basically assumed that Sony already owned Insomniac games. And it's not hard to see why because basically every game Insomniac made was an, was an exclusive for Sony consoles. Like seriously, go back and you'll find like every game they made was either PS1, PS2, PS3, whatever, you know? Hell, I didn't even find out that Insomniac was an independent studio until Sunset Overdrive was announced. Like, I'll, I'll never forget when they made that announcement. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, does Sony know about this? Like, did, did Sony Microsoft, like, make a deal or something? No, nope, no, they were always independent. They just decided, hey, let's just make every game for Sony consoles. Heck, this whole thing reminds me of uh, Nintendo and Rare, because to this day, people still believe that Nintendo owned Rare. They they don't realize that that never actually happened. Uh, Rare was always an independent company. Granted, Nintendo at one point did own like 49% of stock in the company, but they never went beyond that. And they never went to fully acquire Rare, uh, even to the surprise of the Stamper Brothers. Like they were they, like they were kind of hoping Nintendo would like make them an offer and Nintendo just never did. And then Microsoft came by and said, hey, you guys, we, we got this Xbox thing. We need new studios. We need new games. You guys want to join us? Here's lots of money. And Rare just like, okay, <laughs> they just went with Microsoft. 
Of course, depending on how you look at it, it was either a bad thing or a good thing. But uh, either way, I look forward to see what Insomniac has in store. You know, since, hey, maybe since Sony owns both Naughty Dog and Insomniac, maybe the two can work together on something. Maybe they can... Maybe we could finally have a crossover between Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. That'd be pretty interesting. Could kind of like, uh, kind of like how uh, I think it was Activision. They put out the crossover between Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. Yeah, kind of like do that, but with just like Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. Anyway, next topic. All right. So this past week was, of course, Gamescom in Europe, and. A whole bunch of uh, interesting games were announced, but Nintendo had something very interesting. They held a Indie Direct. Well, they called it the Indie World Showcase, but it's basically just a Nintendo Direct for indie games. And there was a whole bunch of stuff announced. But there's, I want to mostly highlight games that caught my attention. Uh, the first one, of course, was Risk of Rain 2. I, I have the original on Steam, and I actually kind of like it. If you've never played it, it's a... 2d like roguelike and you will die a lot <laughs> but the sequel definitely seems to take it in a interesting direction so i definitely look forward to that uh the other game that they announced was blasphemous which actually looks pretty awesome that one instantly caught my attention because it's a 2d hack and slash game with uh, some really nice looking sprite work so and that one is coming out september 10th so i'm definitely going to be looking forward to that but the two games that uh, really caught my attention, really got me excited. One was the Hotline Miami collection. That's right. They're putting Hotline Miami 1 and 2 on the Switch. And that one I instantly put on my wish list. I'm going to wait a little bit longer to get it. But it, they said it was coming out that exact same day. So you can get it right now. Um, so, And I would probably recommend you do because it's a very fun game. The other one, of course, was Ori in the Blind Forest, which caught everyone by surprise. It's That game has always been an exclusive for the Xbox One, so it's good to see it's at least coming out. And that, you know, at least Microsoft's partnership with Nintendo didn't just end with one game. Like, I was happy when they, heard, when they sort of made that partnership and announced Cuphead, and I was kind of hoping it wasn't going to end with just Cuphead. So it's good that they're still working together, and I look forward to see what other games they put on there. I mean, obviously, they're not going to start, like, putting, like, Halo on the Switch or anything like that. That's never going to happen. But to see other indie games getting a release outside of the Xbox platform... I, you know, I look forward to see what Nintendo and Microsoft have planned. So anyway, next topic. All right, this is pretty intriguing. So as we all know, the PS5 is right now in development. That's that's not a major secret. That's been known for a lot while. Hell, it was even confirmed by Mark Cerny. He was like interviewed for another publication and he just came right out and said, oh, by the way, I'm developing the PS5 right now. And here's a couple of specifications for it. So it's not a major secret. It's not something we don't know about. But what's interesting is what came out this past week. Apparently, according to a Dutch tech site, they've gotten a hold of what, they, what appears to be a design patent for the PS5. Now, if you look at the thing, it looks strange. It looks kind of like, like a V. It's like a V-shaped sort of system. It's very weird looking. But... I kind of doubt that this is actually real because here's the thing. A lot of this stuff is easily faked. It's very easy to fake this stuff, especially since it's a line drawing. You could basically do this stuff in Illustrator and make it look professional. However, some people feel that this might, this, uh, this it's a little bit credible because apparently a senior artist at Codemasters actually confirmed it. So again, supposedly apparently he retweeted metro's article about the whole thing he said and i quote it's a dev kit we have some in the office so i don't know about this though a lot of people are saying like like oh well this this proves it this proves that it's real but i'm very skeptical about this because soon afterwards not only was the tweet deleted but so was this guy's entire account and it wasn't even verified so I'm not even sure if this is even true or not. I mean, it could be just complete BS. And the thing is, there is a history there of people be completely faking, like, fake game design documents or uh, 
game designs or whatever, prototypes. Uh, if you remember back in early 2016, when all the hype was about what the NX is, there was all these photos that were coming out claiming to be of the NX. And it was supposed to be like this oval system that was like, had on-screen buttons and all this kind of stuff. It showed Zelda Breath of the Wild on it. And people actually believed this whole thing was real and were saying like, oh my God, this is what it's going to be. But then of course, it turned out to be completely fake. Someone actually used a 3D printer to, act to make this thing. So it's easy. If you know what you're doing, it's easy to fake this stuff. Okay. And that's why I hold the, take this stuff with a grain of salt. And it's why I always say, that until it's confirmed, you never believe this sort of crap. Just never. So, all right, folks, I'm going to take a short break, and we'll be right back after this.
All right, folks, and we're back. And I wanted to talk about this last week, but I couldn't fit it in. And that's, of course, on August 14th was the 30th anniversary of the Sega Genesis launch in the United States. And I wanted to talk about this because uh, the Genesis is actually very special to me. It was the first console I ever owned. So I was introduced to the system sometime in the mid mid 90s. I was maybe like six or seven years old. And at the time, uh, during the summer, uh, because my cousins live in the ne- lived in the next town over, what we used to do is my mother would take me and my sister, she'd drop us off at our cousin's house and, house, and then she'd go off to work. And we would just spend all day with them doing a whole bunch of stuff, mostly just like watching television. But the one thing that they had that was just like the most fun was they had a Model 1 Sega Genesis. And this thing was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen at that. And they had a whole bunch of cool games. Uh, of course, from my memory, we used to play stuff like uh, Lion King, for example. Lion King for, for the Genesis is actually pretty good. But uh, it was a pain in the ass to play because we, w- we would get up to the ostrich level. If you don't know, if you, if you never played the game, there's a level where you're riding on top of an ostrich and it's one of those where you have to duck and jump and we could never figure out the combination it was just it, like we tried to like write it down but eventually we just gave up because it just became so impossible uh, another game we used to play was taz escape from mars oh man that was it's not a good game but i kind of enjoy it it's it's a platformer where you're playing taz and he's just trying to escape from marvin the martian it's a fairly decent game and of course you couldn't have a sega genesis without any of the sonic games my cousins had all three uh sonic one was always a good one but we can never get past the the labyrinth zone boss battle if you've never played if you never if you don't know uh the sonic labyrinth zone boss is a pain in the ass because you're not really like fighting robotnik what you're doing is just basically racing him to the top but what makes it annoying is that as you're doing this, there's all these spears and fireballs, and then there's the water that comes up. And of course, you know Sonic and water games. So it becomes just frustrating. And I think I'm the only one in my entire family that actually beat that level. Of course, Sonic 2 is, I I think it's my favorite of all the Genesis games. Sonic 2 is just, mm, that game is so great. Used to play it all the time. In fact, I can basically beat it in one sitting. Of course, there's also Sonic 3, which honestly, it took us forever to actually beat. Because here's the thing, the the one part that we can never get past was the Carnival Night Zone. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the Barrel Room. If you don't, if you don't know, uh, in Sonic 3, there's one part in Carnival Night Zone where basically you're locked in this one area. And you have, all you have on the floor is, and the bottom is like uh, a barrel. And so as kids, we thought like, oh, you could just have to jump up and down on the barrel and just move it down. And we could never get it. We, the timer ran out. I think I remember once I just got so frustrated. I hit the down button and suddenly I just see the barrel go down. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, but another game we really liked to play was Mickey Mania, the timeless adventures of Mickey Mouse. That game is so freaking good. If you've never played it, it's like, it's a platformer. Uh, where you're basically playing Mickey Mouse throughout all most of his movies. So you start off in like Steamboat Willie, and then you go to Plane Crazy, and then uh, the Mad Doctor. The Mad Doctor one is like, that's like the showpiece stage for the entire game. But anyway, if you're interested in playing uh, Mickey Mania, whatever you do, do not go with the Super Nintendo version. Go with either Genesis or Sega CD. The Super Nintendo version is terrible, and I think it's missing one stage. I know there's a PS1 version, but it never came out in North America. I think it was like only in Europe. But um, anyway, my cousins, they also had the Sega CD Model 2. And the funny thing is when you when you hear the Sega CD, most people think of like the terrible FMV games or they think of the good stuff like Sonic CD. But reality, my cousins never really had any of the terrible FMV games. Hell, I didn't even I knew Sewer Shark existed because it was in in an advertisement on the back of one of the manuals. But I didn't know the other ones. I didn't know like I didn't know about uh, what's it called uh, Night Trap. I had no idea that existed, and I didn't know that's what the Sega CD was kind of infamous for. 
But my cousins, they only had two games for the Sega CD. One was Lethal Enforcers 2 Gunfighters. And that game is so great. Oh, man. Like, Lethal Enforcers 2 1 is good, but I think the sequel is much better. And the other one was uh, Bouncers, which is just a forgotten gem. That game is so good. It's If you've never played it, it's a basketball game, except you are and the other player are the basketballs, and so you're trying to bounce each other into each other's uh, net. And so it's it's really fun, but we also sometimes we didn't really uh, play by the rules because there's this one stage in the game where you are, it, it's like, I think it's like a graveyard, and so what's really, the thing about the game is it had all these stage hazards, and so... In this one stage, it had a lightning cloud that would go back and forth. And so if you bounce the other person high enough, they would actually like hit into an electrify. So me and my cousins, we would just try to bounce each other into... We didn't even care about scoring. We just cared more about trying to bounce each other into the electric cloud. Uh, of course, eventually, uh, I got my own Sega Genesis in 1997. Yeah, I was pretty late to the party. Remember, I was born in 89. So anyway, uh, and so I remember the day we got it. It was summer. We're in the mall. And my mom, my sister, and myself are all like we're going to various different stores. And eventually we stopped by KB Toys. And they had a whole display outside of Sega Genesis boxes and the price of $39.99. And so it's sort of because my mom knew that this was the console that me me and my sister had played. So she goes in, she's looking at it, and me and my sister are like, is, is she gonna do it? Like we're just like in, waiting in anticipation to see what she's gonna do. And eventually we walked out of that place with a Sega Genesis and two games. And the two games were Toy Story and Sonic 3. And Toy Story, if you've never played it, is actually a pretty decent game it's not bad it i'd even hazard to say that's actually one of the uh the better movie video games out there but uh anyway we also had stuff like nhl 95 i remember we had uh also mario andretti racing which is it's all right but anyway, I mean, we also used to rent games from Blockbuster because we had one, I think it was a few towns over. And one of the games I remember playing a lot with my sister was <laughs> uh, Jurassic Park The Lost World. Now, the thing about the game is that it plays exactly like Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo, but it has a two-player component to it. And so me and my sister, like, we would just play that. And I remember this one time we played, and we found an SUV. And so the thing about the SUV, though, is if you play it in two-player, you can actually run over the other person. So we didn't even care about the objective of the game. Instead, we cared more about just seeing who could get to the SUV first and just run over each other. We were... Uh... <laughs> We were very sadistic kids. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's one more game I want to talk about. I almost forgot about it. And that is, of course, NBA Hang Time. Now, I know, like NBA Jam is all right, but my personal favorite has always been Hang Time. Because it's, it's, it's basically NBA Jam, except it has a, a create your own character section. So you can actually like create your own little character and all that kind of stuff. And it, that was just a lot of fun. Um, I think that was also released on the PS1 and the N64. So anyway, I still have the Genesis to this day. Uh, of course, it's part of my collection. I still have the box to it and everything. Overall, the Genesis was a pretty damn good system. And it still is to this day. If you can get your hands on one, I highly recommend it. I'd also highly recommend you look into the Genesis uh, Mini. Because it actually looks pretty cool. And I'm kind of even thinking about getting it myself. Even though I have most of those games, um, I don't... What I, the ones that really sort of get me are Mega Man, The Wily Wars, and Tetris, because Wily Wars never came out in the U.S., and Tetris is one of the most one of the rarest games for the Mega Drive in Japan. So, 
overall, happy 30th anniversary to the Sega Genesis. And thank you all for all the memories. Anyway, folks, I'm going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this. folks and we're back and i want to talk about the ion fury controversy for a moment because this is pretty messed up if you don't know there's a game that came out on august 15th called ion fury and it's a actually looks really cool it's this homage to classic shooters from the 90s in fact it's completely developed using the build engine which is the same engine for duke nukem 3d blood shadow warrior and I got to say, the game actually looks, it, it looks awesome and it looks gorgeous. Really goes to show that a lot of these old engines can be put to good use today. So anyway, the game looks really cool, got critical and commercial success. But literally within a day, it met controversy. And this all started because apparently Reset Era got a hold of the game developer's uh, official Discord page where they made some comments that they didn't really like. And now I'm not gonna get into the comments that were made because that would just take too long. But the comments that were made were stuff like talking about how crazy SJWs are and how several of them felt that children should not be uh, transitioning at such a young age. That just gives you an idea of the kind of things that they were saying. So of course, you could probably imagine that how well this went at Reset Era. Oh, they went freaking crazy. And they went to Twitter and started uh, calling for the game developers to be held accountable. They started tweeting out to Voidpoint and 3D Realms about this whole thing. And just as this was all getting started, more stuff came out as... Apparently, some people who went through the game, they found a shampoo bottle that was a parody of Olay that was said oh gay on it. And the other one was they found a room that you needed to no clip into. And apparently on one of the walls, it had the word fag bag on it. And YouTube, don't go after me for saying that. I'm just, I'm just repeating what is commonly known about this whole thing. 
Of course, also the gaming media got involved and they covered the whole thing. And it just became one giant mess of people calling for 3D Realms and Void Point's heads on a silver platter. And so far, this entire thing, uh, 3D Realms uh, issued an apology, Void Point released an apology, and I think it was 3D Realms said that they were going to donate $10,000 to an LGBT uh, organization. And Void Point said that they were going to remove all the stuff and they were going to issue, I think it was diversity tra uh, sensitivity training for the game developers. Now, after this apology was announced, the irony in all this is that Reset Era didn't even accept it. There was a thread about this entire thing, and it was post after post of basically saying the same thing. We appreciate your apology, but we won't accept it because it's not enough. You see, this is why you never apologize to these type of people, folks, because to them, it doesn't matter. You can apologize, you can grovel as much as you want, and no matter what, it is never enough. To them, they will never accept your apology until your entire life is ruined. That's how these people act, all right? Hell, they even kind of prove the game developer's point about how crazy they are, they are by going through the game looking for things to be offended by. You just proved their point. You, what did you find? You found a shampoo bottle and a wall that you couldn't even see. Congratulations, you just proved the point of the game developers. You're batshit crazy. And all of this just for what? Because the game developers had opinions you don't like? That's it? That's what this entire thing is about? For crying out loud, the way these people are acting, you'd think that they, the developers sent out death threats or something like that. Now, there's a theory that's going around the internet that this entire thing was actually the action of a troll. Apparently, the day that this whole thing happened, uh, a user on 4chan had put, made a post claiming to be the person behind this entire thing. And he said that he did this, he purposely went to this Discord, took screenshots, posted it on the Reset Era board on purpose to get them pissed off and go after the game developers. And his whole reasoning was because he felt that the game developers had desexified the main character. Now, personally, I'm of the opinion that OP is lying, but you never know, stranger things have happened. And we have seen in the past uh, people basically weaponizing certain groups on the internet to go after people. Uh, if you want a good example, look at the 4chan Tumblr war of 2014. Re internet Historian did a fantastic video on that. And if, for those who don't know, what happened was, it's now believed that members of the poll board went to Tumblr, got them all riled up about raiding 4chan on the 4th of July. The Tumblr users went over there, raided the page, and then 4chan decided to strike back by literally going after Tumblr and like basically filling all of the tags with porn and gore and putting out misinformation about s deleting system 32, you know, that whole, that old thing. So stranger things have happened. It's possible, but I highly doubt that this person even weaponized uh, reset era. But the idea is actually pretty creepy if you think about it. it it's frightening. The idea that you can convince an entire group of people who are perpetually offended to go after people you dislike, that, that's pretty creepy. It's, it's frightening, okay? Because basically anyone can be targeted. Anyone can be, they could, you could just make a claim, especially with deep faking being a thing right now. You could basically fake someone saying something or you could share a screenshot that they said. You could post it on people that you know are going to get offended by it and then they'll just go after the other person. It's very much possible that that could happen, but I highly doubt that OP is really telling the truth here. Anyway, folks, I'm going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this.
All right, folks, and that's it for this week. I want to thank you all for listening. If you've got any comments, complaints, or questions, just leave them down in the comments section. It's always appreciated. Uh, You can listen to the show on BitChute and YouTube, as well as you can follow me on Twitter and Gab. So I want to thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. And remember that video games will never die.